Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavich. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And we have a guest on today. Uh, we have Dr. Anshul Gupta. He is uh, a, a medical physician. He's just come out with a book not too long ago called Reversing Hashimoto's. Um, I think he just had a summit as well that I was a guest on the summit. Um, so we had a really good conversation on the summit. Um, and so I thought I'd have him on the podcast so he can, we can, get kind of his opinions about thyroid physiology and what he sees what's going on. And we could talk a bit, a little bit about his book as well. So Dr. Gupta, welcome to the Thyroid Answers podcast. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me over here. We already had a great discussion when you came to our summit and a podcast. So I'm definitely looking forward to kind of a next session uh, where we both kind of, you know, uh, share our opinions into this complicated issues of thyroid. So as an MD, right, that I think, unfortunately, the world of medical endocrinology, especially when it comes to thyroid physiology, often gets beat up and bashed pretty much. So I'm sure there's people who are going, oh, medical doctor, I've been to medical doctors and they don't do what I, I think they should be doing. So uh, I was somebody who beat up a little bit on the on the medical profession early on and um, was like, why aren't they doing a better assessment? But then I, as you get a little bit older, I think you get a little bit wiser maybe and you start to go, hey, this is what has been taught. And so people are just doing what it's been taught and what the guidelines are. So why don't you give some give the listeners a little bit of your background, your story, because you're not doing what traditional allopathic medicine is doing when it comes to thyroid physiology and more leaning towards this kind of different functional model uh, regarding thyroid physiology. So give us a little bit of your background and how you got into addressing thyroid physiology. Absolutely. And, you know, again, you know, like as you pointed out correctly, you know, like a lot of our world is divided into, well, either this or that. And uh, what, like, you know, I try to propose is that it's not about this or that. It's kind of getting the best of both worlds. And we all, like, learn together. And it's all about just getting our patients better in the end. So if there is something out there, you know, which can add value to my clients or my patients, definitely I'm up for it. So by training, obviously, I'm a family medicine MD. That's what I was doing for several years. And I was treating thyroid patients as a regular MD as they would do just doing TSH, putting them on levothyroxine. And if the TSH was within normal range, that's it. Nothing more to be done about it. So I know that that was my training and that's what where I was coming from until I was having my own health troubles. So suddenly a couple of years into my private practice, you know, I started having a lot of health issues. I was gaining a lot of weight without changing my lifestyle. You know, I was having a lot of horrible stomach problems, you know, like the stomach issues or the pain was so bad that sometimes I will double over and I thought about going to the emergency room, but I knew they could not do anything about it except for giving me pain medications. The pain will eventually go away, but I had no idea of when it would hit me. I was having terrible brain fog. By the end of the day, I was basically done. Like I was not able to concentrate on anything. I was tired a lot, but to the point that sometimes during my lunch break, I had to take a nap just to function through the day. So a lot of these symptoms were happening. You know, I was my own physician. So I started taking some medications, thought it was mainly the gut issues which are causing problems. Nothing improved. I said, okay, well, when I'm not a smart physician, let me go to all these specialists to fix me. Then I started going to specialists after specialists, got several testing done, endoscopies, ultrasounds, blood work, allergy testing, everything was normal. They keep on adding more and more medications to kind of address different things which they thought were causing it. But obviously nothing was helping. I was only 32 years of age at the time and I was already taking five medications and still I was exactly the same on getting worse. So that's the time, you know, I was feeling very hopeless and like alone of what next should I be doing? That's where I found functional medicine. That's where I understood there is more to learn. There is more physiology underneath that I need to uncover about myself. I started looking for my root causes. Well, why, why am I this way and what is causing that issue? So I found my root causes, you know, I was having a lot of stress in my life. My diet was not the best. You know, I had some gut issues going on, especially with microbiome. I made a plan of simple plan, you know, just kind of fixing my diet, taking some supplements. Within one month, my gut pain was completely gone. Within six months, you know, like I was off all medications, lost 40 pounds. 
I had more energy in my life than I ever had. I even participated in a 5K rugged maniac. And I was never an athletic person. So for me to do that was a big thing. My brain fog was gone. My mental capacity was at par and was doing great. So just with these few things, six months, I was able to turn my life upside down. That was my aha moment. Well, there is something out there. There is something which is causing trouble. We need to start looking for these root causes and fix it. So that's where I decided I need to dedicate my life towards, you know, like helping people out. So I started working at the Cleveland Clinic Functional Medicine Department. That's where I started seeing like a lot of the patients were coming to see me and they have exactly the same symptoms I had. And all of them had Hashimoto's disease. So I was like, wow, this is crazy. All of these Hashimoto's disease patients have exactly the same symptoms. They are exactly doing what the doctors want them to do, but they're not getting better. So I started my own research into like looking more deeper into Hashimoto's disease specific. And that's where I found that, well, there are a lot of different root causes. Hashimoto's disease is much more complicated than we think it is. Conventional medicine still feels Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune condition, but it is basically hypothyroidism that they are aiming to treat by giving levothyroxine. Most of the Hashimoto's patients do not get better even being on this medicine. And the research proves that. So then I started looking, there are several root causes which cause this Hashimoto's disease. And I made a protocol to address those root causes in like in a more systemic manner. And we saw great results. People's antibody levels started getting better. Their symptoms were getting better. Their thyroid medicine dosage was getting better. Everything about them was getting better. So that's where I decided, well, this is great. I need to share this with people. So I kind of, you know, wrote this book, Reversing Hashimoto's, where I shared kind of a big overview of what is going on in Hashimoto's patients, why they're not getting better and what they can do on their own so that, you know, they can see improvement. Okay. So as you're taking a look at it, you're saying, hey, a lot of these people had Hashimoto's. Some people are, might start to consider, okay, so how are we determining the difference between glandular hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. Is there a difference? Are they the same things? How do you distinguish the difference between the two? Since most of the cases are thought to be immune driven, how are you differentiating between, hey, this is just primary hypothyroidism or this is Hashimoto's thyroiditis? So most of the people, you know, like when they are going to the doctors, the only test they are getting is a TSH test. The TSH is basically determining whether they are hypothyroid or not, right? But there is more to it, you know, like the hypothyroid can just be because of various reasons and Hashimoto's is one of those reasons. So people need to get more advanced testing done to check their inflammatory markers as well as the antibody levels. The two antibodies are the thyroid antibodies, which is the TPO antibodies, thyroid peroxidase and the thyroglobulin antibodies. Along with that, I also check their inflammatory markers like HSCRP that also tells me how much underlying inflammation is ongoing in their body, which is driving all this kind of, you know, a cascade of inflammatory destruction. So then they know that whether that is for Hashimoto's or whether they are just plain primary hypothyroidism where their TSH is affected. Obviously, I recommend like you doing more advanced testing of checking their free T3, free T4 so that we can know actual thyroid hormone deficiencies rather than a pituitary or a brain hormone, which is a TSH. Okay. So couldn't somebody have Hashimoto's and their antibodies are negative? So yes, that is an interesting piece. You know, like, so recently, like, you know, in our couple of like, you know, functional doctors have gotten together that a lot of people have Hashimoto's, like a lot of people are presenting with Hashimoto's like symptoms, but their antibodies are negative. So we are coming with this terminology of like antibody negative Hashimoto's, you know, like these patients are presenting with. Now, still, obviously, like, you know, uh, conventional medicine doesn't recognize anything like that, that there is nothing like an antibody negative Hashimoto's, whether you have antibodies or you don't have antibodies, according to them. But we feel that, you know, the antibody negative Hashimoto's do exist and people can have that. Yeah. And I'll I'll add to that. So when we look at Hashimoto's, there's been a number of papers that go on when we look at thyroiditis and what's going on with people is that for the listeners, there's there's two kind of two sides to the immune system. Typically, when you have damage to the gland, it's driven by the immune system. So 
you can have, there's something called TH1 dominance, something called TH2 dominance. And so a, what some of the literature is, is expressing is that depending on whether you're TH1 dominant or TH2 dominant may determine whether you have antibodies or don't have antibodies. And you may shift from TH1 dominance potentially early on to more TH2 dominant later through the process. And sometimes as you're getting better and your immune system starting to balance out, you may go from no antibodies to developing some antibodies, but you're actually in a better state just because the immune system is starting to balance out. So there's been a number of papers of that, and there's there's actually a test. I don't know if you run any of Cyrex Labs panels, but Cyrex Labs has a immune panel. It's called their lymphocyte map test. And that actually measures the difference between uh, where the T cell populations are. Are they Th1 dominant, Th2 dominant, and breaks that down. And I've run a bunch of those tests over the last two years since those tests came out. And what I find is what I think is pretty consistent is the vast majority of the patients who are who who have thyroiditis going on, who have hypothyroidism, are TH1 dominant in the process. And so what I think is we just, we class, my opinion, I'll let you kind of jump in there, is that we say, well, that's it's primary hypothyroidism. It's not Hashimoto's because the antibodies are negative. I think it's just, it's, I think almost all the cases are immune driven and it may be just the influence of where they're, are they TH1 dominant or TH2 dominant? So I think it's, it's thyroiditis, it's immune driven, but the antibodies may or may not have a ton. It, it that may not change our perspective on, on that. It's, that it's immune driven process. So I don't get too hung up. Is it Hashimoto's not Hashimoto's because we know that TH1, TH2 process can swing. Now there's yeah, also- so The interesting part is that, you know, like obviously when the thyroid disorders were first discovered, you know, like uh, they were discovered because there was iodine deficiency, right? So that's where the primary hypothyroidism came into play. So a lot of people are still hung up on that aspect that whether well, iodine deficiency is causing the hypothyroidism. But as you correctly pointed out, now currently it's all Hashimoto's, you know, like, you know, we rarely see iodine deficiencies because of all the changes that has been done in the dietary patterns. So that is almost nil. And you're correct, like, you know, everything is immune driven. So even person with a primary hypothyroidism, if it is coming to see us in the clinic, they said, well, my antibodies are negative, then I don't have any immune dysfunction. So I said, no, no, no. That that's what it doesn't mean. It just basically means your immune system is not in that phase of producing those antibodies. And as you have and you and me have seen that, un, and as soon as we start addressing the underlying immune dysfunction for these people, they do get better. Exactly. So it's like you know we do have like you know uh, in between mutual patients that once we address that underlying issues, they do get better. That itself points towards that point that it's more immune driven rather than iodine deficiency or just one day your thyroid gives up. That just doesn't happen. And since we talk, since you mentioned iodine, I'm going to bring up the one of the big controversies in functional medicine is uh, I don't have um, some. There's a camp that says everybody needs iodine, right? And then there's another right. camp that says everybody's iodine has excessive iodine, right? And so people are not quite sure what to do. There's a conversation that if you have TPO antibodies, you can't have any iodine in the system um, because the as you increase iodine, it increases TPO activities. And if you increase TPO activities, then the TPO antibodies start to gobble away at the thyroid gland. So let me kind of kind of ask you this: Where do you fall in the iodine camp? First, we'll ask answer that question. Get you to answer that question. I'm in the middle. You know, so I feel that, you know, everybody, uh, so again, obviously, you know, like we have both the research, right? Iodine deficiency causes Hashimoto's and excess iodine causes Hashimoto's. The problem lies is that how do we measure it, right? You know, we don't have the perfect test to actually check where, you know, in a person's status of iodine, even the blood test, even the 24 hour urine test for iodine, you know, like it is not hundred percent foolproof, right? So that's at least that's what I believe in. So that's where, you know, I feel that some iodine is needed, but I'm not in the camp where everybody's excess iodine or in the camp that everybody needs too much iodine. So I've come with the conclusion that, you know, I try to give iodine to my patients mainly through diet. 
you know, like if just include, you know, some dietic approach to the iodine, have it in, in your diet on the regular basis. And that should give you enough iodine to support your body, but we don't need excess iodine. So that's where the middle route that I have taken uh, at this point of time. Uh, and that's kind of where I am at, right? I think the weird, you know, it's almost like politics. We, we hear the extremes of the conversation. Uh, I think most of us would agree that iodine is really important for health and physiology and the immune in the immune system, but you've got, we just want to be cautious, right? It's not one extreme or the other. I don't think you have to live in fear of iodine, but I do want to touch on the next piece because you're talking about Hashimoto's. We're talking about TPO antibodies. I'd like to get your perspective on what you think these antibodies that people talk about. I'm glad you said it that, hey, it doesn't matter if you have antibodies or not, because you still have to drive address the things that are driving that immune process. And I think that's a concern. Sometimes people go, well, I don't have Hashimoto, so I don't have to do all this stuff, right? Because it's not, it's not immune driven, but you do. But what concern should somebody have about the TPO antibodies? Some people get really hung up on the antibodies. And I know probably 25, 30 years ago when I was learning, we were learning about the antibodies causing all the damage like little Pac-Men. Where, where do you stand on the amount of damage that TPO antibodies do, the thyroglobulin antibodies do? So for me, is this an indication? You know, like again, um, I don't think our tests currently are so advanced that, you know, it can say that, okay, well, let's say your TPO antibodies are 3,000. And the 3000 means that, you know, there is this percentage of thyroid gland, which is being destroyed as compared to another person who has, let's say 1500 of thy TPO antibodies. And then that person would have very less of the damage. I don't think we have this kind of, you know, a complete correlation at this point of time. What we know is that definitely antibodies are related to Hashimoto's and they do signify that your thyroid gland is being destroyed. Now, how much is going to be destroyed depends on a whole bunch of other things, you know, in that particular individual, their genetic makeup, you know, like what is going on with their thyroid, what is going on with their whole other immune dysfunction, what is going on with their other systems which support the thyroid gland in general, whether it is gut, whether it's toxins, you know, and all those other things which are overburdening the system. So I think it's a complete overall picture which needs to be looked at determine what kind of damage is being done uh, for an individual in a thyroid situation or Hashimoto's situations. The antibodies do signify that, you know, yes, there is an active destruction going on and there is definitely antibodies present in your body. But for me, they are not a complete indication. Well, you know, like if this person antibodies are 3000 or well, you know, if it comes back to like 200, that means there is no destruction going on and he can just go back to living what he was doing before. And that way, you know, like he will never have any issues. So for me, these are just a guide or those are indication that there is still a problem present and that we need to look at the overall approach or overall situation of what is going on so that that is overburdening his or her thyroid. Yeah, I, I think it's a delicate topic, and I, I agree, agree that we use it as a as a kind of a guide as to what's going on, because in some in our space, there's people saying, "Hey, you have to you have to suppress the antibodies, you have to suppress the antibodies." But again, if we go back to Th1 or Th2 dominance, just because you don't have antibodies doesn't mean you have thyroiditis. And some of the most recent literature on the antibodies show that the thyroglobulin antibodies don't cause any damage to the thyroid gland. And the TPO antibodies probably cause very little damage to the gland. So people go like, well, well then what's doing it? It's the it, what we call the infiltrating lymphocytes that are doing the damage. And again, depending on what the, that pattern is, you could have lots of thyroiditis, lots of damage going down, going on. And not not much in the way of antibodies, but that doesn't mean that you've, just because your antibodies are zero, that you've fixed the problem. You could still have damage and dysfunction going on to the gland. So I think it's important not to try and sometimes actively suppress, like what can I do to suppress the antibodies versus say, okay, if antibodies are going up, is there potentially more damage going down? If antibodies are going down, that probably means I'm headed in the right direction. There's probably less because I, I try and get the patients to think about the antibodies like the cleanup crew, right? So mm -hmm. if there's a if there's a lot of damage being done, there might be a lot of antibodies. And so it's 
you wouldn't blame the guys cleaning up after New Year's for causing all the damage, just like we maybe we shouldn't be cause, thinking that it's just the antibodies resulting in the damage. Now, there's also people in our space that are saying, hey, your, t your t thyroglobulin antibodies and TPO antibodies need to be zero for you to have health. I'm not sure where people get that information from, but uh, right. you know, are you aware that that if your thyroid antibodies are at zero, there's no damage occurring to your gland. Have you seen that <laughs> anywhere? Uh, there is no research study, you know, like, as you said, you know, that's what, if you're talking about, there is no research study exactly saying that if there is like, if you, you know, have hundred antibodies and suddenly, you know, like within a few months, it goes to zero. There is no damage happening. Absolutely. There is no research behind it. People are just thinking, you know, like they're using their mind saying that, okay, well, if there are like thousand antibodies, by bringing it to zero, that means you are getting better. So that's the kind of thing that practitioners are extrapolating, you know, but there is no data behind it. Uh, certainly not that we have seen in our practice that, you know, like, and we always caution our patients that getting the antibodies back to normal is, first of all, is not the goal. If they get better, that is a good thing. But obviously working on the underlying immune process, underlying root causes is what you want to do. And first of all, people, I tell them, trust your body. You know, they are going to give you signs and symptoms that, you know, if your body is getting better, you are feeling good within your own body. That is a sign things are getting better. If the antibodies remain the same, just don't get hung up about it so much. Or other person is working so much and their antibodies are really good, but they are feeling like crap. Obviously, like that is saying that still there is things which are missing out in their protocol or in their plan that needs to be addressed. Right. So you know, definitely like, you know, just looking at the antibodies itself is not enough. Awesome. So let's move on to, hey, in functional medicine, we're typically talking, we need to run a little bit more comprehensive thyroid panel to assess somebody. Where's you, where do you stand? Some people look at, hey, I think I just needed, you know, traditional allopathic model is TSH and free T4. Some people are TSH free hormones and antibodies. Some people think uh, total values are important. Some people think T3 uptake is important. Some people don't think those are important. When you're looking at somebody's th thyroid physiology, what are you looking at and trying to, uh, to, as from a testing perspective, what tests do you think we need to be looked at, look at that and run? So, I mean, there are some basic tests that I think everybody should get, you know, like which does include the TSH, the free T3, the free T4 and the antibody levels, the TPO and the thyroglobulin. So I think those should be done, you know, like each and every patient so that we know where they are lacking on where they're happening. Now, beyond that, it depends on person to person. So like, let's say a lot of people do order reverse T3. And the problem with the reverse T3 is that majority of the labs, you know, I have spoken with them, even at the Cleveland Clinic lab, when we were doing the reverse T3, they would say that, you know, this is one of those tests that we don't even know what are we measuring it correctly or not, because they are not, not set values for it, even for the lab parameters to calibrate their machines. They said, we are doing it. We think we're doing it correctly, but we don't know. So that was an eye opener. Well, we are following a number, which even within the same lab, it might give us different ranges at different times. So then definitely different labs will have variations to it. But that being said, reverse T3 can give us, you know, like if the number is really very high, it definitely, you know, says something that something is going on, which is causing that number to be going very high. But I don't monitor it very regularly. I just measure it once so that I know whether it is very high or not. So we can specifically, you know, work on things which can cause the reverse T3 to be high. Now okay. the other things like doing ultrasounds or doing the T3 uptake scans and things, Majority of my patients, you know, like not able to do those tests. So that's the reason we don't opt for it uh, because we are a completely virtual practice. So we have to rely a lot of times on their practitioners, like the local practitioners to order those tests for them. And obviously we don't find a lot of open practitioners who are ready to do that stuff. So but just I a regular, how about just a regular T3 uptake test that can be done traditionally at the lab. You don't typically run that. Are you looking at thyroglobulin at all? Because if, and what would be the reasoning behind not looking at the total hormones? We can run that, like we can look at the total hormones, but I believe that we are more interested in looking at the free hormones in terms of, at least my belief is that, you know, if the free hormones are the ones that your body is utilizing in terms of the actual thyroid hormones. 
So uh, that's what we have traditionally followed to make sure that they're getting enough of the thyroid hormones at the cellular level uh, instead of following the total hormones. So, so let me ask you a question when we get to that to, about that, because isn't it possible that somebody could have low free hormones, but appropriate levels of total hormone? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of times it can be either or the other way, but we do see a lot of times that their total hormones are perfectly fine and their free hormones are on the lesser side. Okay. But if we just look at free hormones, then we may not get as complete a picture, right? We might think, oh, I just need to give more hormone where the, the, the issue that free levels could be low might be too much binding globulin, binding up those free hormones, right? Right. So we don't like make too much adjustments on the medications unless, you know, like, you know, there is uh, like, we feel that, that they are like totally on the lower side or very low on the range. So we try to see, okay, well, if it is on the lower side, it is just not about adjusting the medications. It's where something else is going on, which is causing those, you know, the, those hormones to be on the lower side. Okay. Uh, so if you so see lower free hormone, you're saying you're thinking that there's a reason why it's not coming off the off the binding globulin and you're going to try and address that but if the free t values are normal but the person has hypothyroid signs and symptoms then what how are you distinguishing the difference between those two things Right. So again, so people, when they come to see us, first of all, they are not coming as a new diagnosis to us, right? They have mm -hmm. always been already on medications, you know, or they're very new to Hashimoto's where they don't need medications, right? So that's the first majority of the clients that we see that comes to our practice. So if they're already established on the medications, what we tend to work on is that, okay, well, let's work on their underlying root causes and kind of work on addressing those and see if that itself is going to regulate their immune system and regulate their hormone levels. And then obviously follow their symptomatology in terms of how they're doing with the symptoms. They are still have symptoms of hypothyroidism or not. And if they do get better, you know, with the other protocols, what we tend to see in our practice is that the thyroid hormones also start normalizing a lot of times. You know, in okay. terms of the requirement of the body, that's what I believe the requirement of the body is normalizing. And that's the reason, you know, like suddenly we see that they start having in the normal range of the thyroid hormone. Okay. So somebody comes in, their TSH is normal, their free T4 is normal or towards the higher end of the reference range or maybe lab high, and their free T3 is lower. Some people would say, well, your body forgot to convert, forgot how to convert it. Like you have a deionase polymorphism and therefore you can't convert it. Um, they might say that you're selenium deficient or um, some other cofactor deficiency. Um, and their thought process is that to help somebody, we just need to, and you hear this term a lot, we need to optimize your T3, we need to give you T3 to bring that T3 value back into range. Do you look at the labs the same way when you're looking at them? So I, I rarely ask people to start taking T3 in itself, you know, like again, you know, like I try to again, looking at whether, as you said, you know, like definitely we are looking at other parameters or why they're not converting. So we try to optimize all of the other reasons, you know, as you mentioned, selenium, zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, whatever is needed for the T4 to T3 to convert and then see how they're doing instead of directly starting on the T3 hormone itself. That's okay. what not a first approach. Now, let's say if you work on everything else and still like their T3 is down the tank and they're just not improving, then definitely we do like, you know, recommend them starting at a very low dosage of T3. But what I see is that a lot of practitioners are doing very, very heavy doses of T3. And, you know, like, I just believe that that is not helping a lot of patients. And actually, a lot of times it backfires and that makes them worse. So if we have to replace, we replace with very low dosages. Yeah. So, I, and I agree with that. I think we're jumping, we're thinking that if we optimize the blood value, it optimizes the tissue physiology. And what we see many times is somebody gets a little boost initially. And then they're like, then they plateau and then they're like, okay, I'm back to where I was. And then they need a stronger dose. And then they wind up on these really high doses and feel awful. 
and getting them off of those high doses is like taking somebody off crack, right? They are like going through uh, a lot of problems and maybe we'll talk about why that might be. So when you see somebody, chronic hypothyroid signs and symptoms, TSH has been normalized, whether it's T4, let's use T4. It's been normalized with T4, but their free T3 is still low. And for the people out there who are looking at reverse T3 and saying, okay, reverse T3 is high, free T3 is low, they still have, but their TSH is normal. What are the thoughts that are running through your mind as to what's going on and why T3 is low? Why is reverse T3 potentially high? So again, that comes back to the root causes. So I feel like, you know, when the reverse T3 is high or the, the T3 is low, first of all, you know, like conversion is an issue, which can be because of deficiency of either selenium, zinc, magnesium, or B vitamins. But the toxins and stress also play a very important role in the kind of where people are not feeling good and the reverse T3 is on the higher side. So I feel that, you know, in those people, like I'm definitely looking at their toxin panels and making sure that they're not getting exposed to any kind of toxins. Or looking at the stress functions or whether, you know, they are going through stressful situations in their life or their adrenal function is not great. And that's what is tanking, you know, like their thyroid. So those are the things that I have, I'm looking at in those people. Nutritional deficiency, stress and toxins. So and we hear like, hey, T3 is low, reverse T3 high. Maybe it's a selenium deficiency. But the problem I have with that argument is you the same the deiodinases all the deiodinases use the same cofactors to do conversion so if you're selenium deficient and your t3 is low but your reverse t3 is elevated could that really be selenium deficiency right because it's the same deiodinase enzyme that's it's not the same enzyme but the same they all three of the enzymes use the same cofactor so could you be selenium deficient? Possibly, but I don't think that's the root issue for most people. I agree with you that there's something else creating a stress response on the tissue. So I talk about glandular hypothyroidism, like the gland can't make enough, but then I talk about tissue hypothyroidism, which is that the tissues or the cells don't have sufficient T3 inside them. So, and I think what we're both in agreement on is that something's causing the cells to not convert T4 to T3 at sufficient levels. So some people think that that's broken physiology. The cells forgot how to do it. They don't want to convert T4 to T3 so for some reason. So I need to give them T3. I think you're probably in more in my camp that maybe this isn't broken physiology at the cell level. Maybe this is something where the cells are adapting and saying, hey, we don't want increased cell metabolism. So is that how you see it? And how do you think that, how did, how do you see that playing out? No, absolutely. So again, you know, like the point was not that, you know, it's an isolated selenium deficiency and it's generally like multiple things which are happening. And that's the reason, you know, uh, we do testing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we rely on the testing, like we do uh, these nutrival tests or other testing where we can actually see whether those people are deficient into selenium, zinc or whatever there it is. And plus checking the toxins, plus checking the adrenal functions and all that stuff. And then, you know, that helps us to take a, a good picture. Okay, well, what is causing what? If the selenium levels are great and if it is higher, then definitely that is not causing their, you know, the conversion not to happen. And if their stress levels are high or if the adrenals are short or, you know, they have toxin, then we have reasoning for it. So that's the reason, you know, in, in our practice, I, we use a lot of testing methods uh, to kind of determine what their potential root causes are. But I totally agree that just throwing hormones, you know, like to people just blindly is not going to solve the problem. Whether those are synthetic hormones, whether those are natural hormones, whether it's T4 or T3 or anything, that is not going to solve the problem. Yes, I'm not saying that nobody needs hormone, that you should stop all your medications. That's not the point over here. But the point is that, you know, we cannot just rely on one thing. You know, so, if the one thing you're doing it is not solving the problem, then definitely more things need to be looked at. So what did, let's kind of talk about what's driving the the process. What's driving the, the when we're talking about toxins and stress, is that impacting, do you see that the, the toxins, the stressors are impacting the thyroid gland directly and the issue is that the thyroid gland can't make hormone or do you think that the stress, the toxins is impacting the peripheral cells 
and maybe the thyroid gland. And that's, and that's more of the factor. How do you see these toxins and stressors? How do they, how do they reduce T4 to T3 conversion? How are they resulting in thyroiditis occurring? So again, yeah, I mean, it's very less of the factor that they directly impact the thyroid. That's what are like, you know, that's what a lot of people think that directly they're impacting the thyroid and thyroid is not producing enough thyroid hormone. I feel it's like, you know, they're affecting more towards the peripheral tissues and the peripheral immune system and overburdening those things. And then again, causes what we call a cellular resistance sometimes where the cellular efficiency is lower. Cell, cell, uh, the cells are not able to utilize those hormones, plus the cells are not able to convert those hormones. And the cellular machinery itself is not functioning at their optimal. I talk a lot about mitochondrial destruction in that fashion, is that a lot of these toxins and other things are mitochondrial killers. And mitochondrial obviously, mitochondria is a like you know is a powerhouse of the cell, which is you know useful for almost doing everything that a cell wants to do, whether it's producing energy, whether that is you know controlling your age, whether you know that is controlling your metabolism, all of those things kind of you know the mitochondria controls, and that is not functioning, or that is these all these toxins and stresses leading to that destruction also, which is ultimately leading to the thyroid dysfunction and also thyroid hormones not able to being converted or like not be able to utilize by the cells. So I think it's a very less thing, uh, less percentage of directly impacting these toxins on the thyroid, but more so in the peripheral tissue and the cellular level where they cause this destruction. So let's kind of walk through why, like how a toxin might trigger problems with the mitochondria that impacts thyroid hormone. How do you how do you explain it to your clients that, hey, or maybe even a higher level for physicians, how's that occurring? Is it the toxins are in there and it's damaging the tissue and that's causing the thyroid hormone to be deactivated um, on purpose because the machinery is broken? Some people might think that, oh, if it's just the toxin and it's shutting down thyroid hormone, then why wouldn't giving t more T3 be beneficial? Because that should help the mitochondria, right? So how do you how do you see that toxin or organism or whatever triggering mitochondrial process and how is it impacting the thyroid hormone directly? So in our immune systems, right, you know, we have these pattern recognition receptors, you know, like which are present in all of our cells, right? You know, and they're, they're, these are like toll-like receptors and, you know, like different PAMs and PAMs that we have over there. And they're recognizing different patterns, you know, and that's the way the cell communicates with the external environment of ours. So whether it is toxins, whether it is, you know, hormonal deficiencies, whether that is, you know, like any kind of infection that is going through, these dams and PAMs, you know, like gets activated when these toxins or anything attaches to them and leads to the activation of an immune cascade. When this immune cascade kind of gets activated, it leads to the destruction of the internal cellular machinery, which is the mitochondria is a major part of it. Now we do have this cellular resilience where, you know, uh, the uh, we do have cells or, you know, like immune regulators where at certain levels, at least I believe that, you know, they can take care of these toxins or any destruction which is being caused, they can repair it. But I think on, on the whole, a lot of times we do get exposed to so many things at the same time or there's so much going on in our bodies whether that is infections or cellular immunity, or we have these genetic components, which is what you call as a weak links, that your body is not able to tolerate those particular organisms or toxins. And this causes such a heightened immune response. And that's what ultimately leads to the destruction of it. So even if we give them more uh, like hormones, it is not doing anything at the underlying process of this activation of the immune system and then leading to the destruction of those things. So we have to go to the root cause, which is causing that immune dysfunction or activation of those cells so that we can kind of, you know, reverse it. Yeah. So for, for the listeners, I, I'll tell you how I see it. And I think it's similar to what you're saying, but I, I kind of talk about in, in my model that I talk about in my book, I talk about the cells and especially the mitochondria have our sensors of the cell for danger. And so if the, if you have toxins or organisms that are stealing and they're in the cell, stealing energy from the cell, the mitochondria has a sensor for that and actually has the ability to say, whoa, there's a threat, there's a danger, let's activate this kind of cell danger physiology. And that activates that's 
releases those damps and pamps out to the immune system to say, hey, we're in trouble, we're in, in um, under attack and can activate that immune system. But the cell itself, the way I look at it based on my research is when the mitochondria senses that danger, whether it's toxin or trauma or whatever, that that when that sense danger signal gets activated, the I think the down regulation of T3 in the cell is a calculated adaptive change. Do you see it from that perspective? Because I've heard the argument that it's just, it's not an adaptive change. The body just, those toxins stop the process. And that's the justification for giving more thyroid hormone. Um, but I don't think that's, I don't see that being the right strategy. I don't, think the cells and the cellular intelligence is broken, I really look at more of the down regulation of thyroid hormone as the adaptive change. Where are your thoughts on those things? I think again, like both, I, I believe, you know, like, again, this is, this can definitely be uh, like a good uh, explanation of what is happening. For me, the ultimate thing is that yes, the T3 is low, but why that is low, that is the most important thing or aspect over here. Just throwing more T3 is not going to solve the problem. That's what I believe into. Now, whether that is a cellular, like, you know, adaptive mechanism or whether that is happening just because of the immune dysfunction or the cellular destruction caused by these toxins, ultimately, you know, like for, it's very difficult for me to kind of uh, justify this way or that way. My belief is that, you know, like the T3 is low, which is mainly happening because of like, you know, the destruction of the mitochondria or the cellular machinery. And that's what we need to repair or we need to kind of remove those things which are causing the destruction. And then the body will again start kind of rebalancing the hormones and everything will come back to normal. Do you see a potential problem when that thought process isn't considered and we just consider giving more thyroid hormone in those situations? Is there any potential risks of just giving them thyroid hormone without addressing those things? So again, first of all, let's, let's say we keep giving more and more thyroid hormone. First of all, people do not feel better. You know, they actually feel worse a lot of times on increasing those thyroid hormones. And sometimes people go on such very high doses that we do see then, you know, getting those people off those medications is very, very challenging. And obviously nobody, and then what I have seen is that, you know, like people will go on these periods during the day, whether actually they will express the symptoms of being hyperthyroid uh, rather than being hypothyroid. And that is very interesting. And it is not generally around the time of the med time when they take the medicine. It can be randomly other times during the day. They'll exhibit suddenly symptoms of hyperthyroid and they will go into hypothyroid again. So because again, you know, I believe that, you know, because you're giving such a high doses, the body is not able to regulate how much thyroid hormone should be going to the cells or there is no uh, cellular machinery for that. So those are the biggest issues that I see. And then because the cell is not able to function properly, it is not able to kind of, you know, like regulate the use of the thyroid hormones and underlying destruction is still happening, you know, like because of these underlying root causes, which are playing the role. So we are not ultimately solving any problem. We are just kind of patching it, you know, with a bandaid by giving them a hormone. Yeah. And I, I do think there's a risk potentially to giving more thyroid hormone than somebody needs besides the fact that they don't just feel better. Um, there is some discussion that T4 is in, you'll hear people say T4 is an inactive hormone. It doesn't do anything. Uh, that's actually not the case. Uh, thyroid hormone has both genomic actions, the things that we see at the genes in replication, but thyroid hormone helps regulate inside the cell t3 specifically has cell has non-genomic actions inside the cell but so does t4 and t4 um i've seen by looking at mitochondrial panels where people on higher dose t4 have increased replication of their mitochondrial density yet still don't have optimal thyroid hormone machinery or mitochondrial function. So we just make more sick mitochondria, which creates more problem. And there is some literature that came out 2019 that talks about how there's an increased incidence of whole a, a lot of different cancers in people who are taking 
thyroid medication and it's over like the next five or 10 years. And there's a beautiful paper. I thought nobody would ever do that paper, but somebody did do that paper and say, looked at all the incidences and some of the literature that's out there says that, hey, maybe Hashim or maybe hypothyroidism is a protective response to prevent sick cells from replicating. And I, I really think that that makes a lot of sense in a lot of situations. So I do think there's a potential downside just to keep blasting everybody with thyroid hormone. One, as you said, it doesn't address the underlying issues as to why this happened. And two, there is some potential risk, but it's not a today or tomorrow risk. It may be a five-year, 10-year risk. And we don't even consider the fact that, hey, did what did what we were doing to help manage a thyroid condition potentially create another problem? So let's talk about identifying issues because really people, as they listen to podcasts, they want to know, okay, but what do I do? Like, how do I go and find out we hear this root cause, root cause, root cause. You got to identify the root cause. Uh, I'm a firm believer that it's not a root cause, but it's the load that we put on the system. So how do you go about assessing what's causing or what's driving the process um, so that people can kind of get an idea of, okay, what are what's another thought process to figure out? Uh, it's not about T4 and T3. I get that. It's not about just making those normal. I got to find my root cause. How do we find it? How does somebody figure out what's their root causes? And I think uh, that's where the art of medicine comes into place. You know, like, you know, I think the, the modern medicine is more reliant on just lab values and just like kind of just, you know, and throwing the lab values. Okay, well, that's the ultimate thing. But I think that's the art of medicine. Now we have to figure out what potential root causes are there. So in our practice, what we do is that even before we order a single test, you know, I actually see my clients for the first visit through like, you know, a comprehensive evaluation, you know, by going all the way to their childhood to now, what has been happening in their life that sometimes give us clues or ideas about our clinical evaluation of the potential root causes. You know, what kind of stressors they have gone through, whether, you know, like their Hashimoto's or thyroid condition was diagnosed after, let's say, one year of being in a stressful relationship. So that tells us that stress is playing a role or whether they are reacting to too many foods, you know, or their diet has been very poor, then definitely food can also be a very potential trigger for them. Or they were living in a moldy environment or they were living in a house and suddenly as soon as they moved into the house, two years down the lane is where they got diagnosed with thyroid disorder that again tells us that whether mold is causing an issue or not, right? And a lot of people have these symptoms or whether that runny nose or, you know, like allergy symptoms or itchy eyes. Again, that points towards a lot of different toxins that they might be going through. Then parasites in the gut, if they have a lot of international travel they have gone through or they have gut-related symptoms of like constipation, bloating or diarrhea, then potential triggers could be candida or parasites, or just SIBO, or poor gut microbiome in that fact. Or infections, you know, a lot of people go through very frequent viral infections, you know, that they have gone through in their lifetime. Again, tells us that maybe they have underlying viral infection like Epstein-Barr, or some like Lyme disease or anything that might have caused it. So these are like different ways, different like evaluatory questions that we ask our clients when we are doing them for the first visit. So that kind of guides it into some potential root causes, you know, that we can narrow it down because I kind of talk about big five categories of root causes. One of them is like the food sensitivities, you know, which can be different kind of food which are triggering uh, or damaging, you know, like uh, the body. The second one, as we discussed, is toxins, whether that is heavy metals or mold toxins or environmental toxins. The third one is nutritional deficiencies, like whether they are deficient to zinc or selenium or vitamin D or vitamin B12 or anything else, right? Or it can be infections like Epstein-Barr, you know, or, you know, we are recently seeing a big surge after COVID infections or Lyme disease. Or last one is stressors, you know, whether they went to any kind of stressors in their life. So these are the big, big uh, five different categories that we evaluate all of our patients into. And then once I narrow it down for them, okay, well, I think these are the main three or four uh, players in your case. Let's order a specific test to kind of check whether they are, you know, your real root causes or not. And that's where, you know, uh, we order those specific functional medicine tests for our clients to kind of see where they are with those root causes. And what is the whole load, as you said, 
of those potential root causes because everybody has toxins, right? You know, it's not that every anybody on this earth who's living will be not have any toxins. So that's not the point. The point is looking at the whole toxin panel and looking and seeing what is the total body burden of toxin rather than saying, okay, well, I have a little bit of mercury. Okay, well, that's my problem and I need to just get it out. Okay, well, let's look at the whole panel and a little bit of mercury is not going to cause Hashimoto's in each and every person. But a little bit of mercury, a little bit of lead, a little bit of mold, and then a little bit of glycosate. So okay, well, that together does create a burden. Yeah. So that's kind of the dance that we play with our clients and a little bit of, you know, our clinical evaluation and then obviously supplementing or adding the labs on top of it. And that's not the answer everybody wants to hear, right? So what, it, what people want to hear is what's the thing? right? What's the thing, what's this thing that you can give me something to kill or crush or eliminate and it all goes back, right? right. We, I talk about it. I, you talk about it. You can't, you have to take a look at the entirety of the load. And I think what's important for people to understand, because people say, well, I, I did heavy metal detox. I did mold program. I did that. I did that. And I still don't feel well. And they, and so they're frustrated and I get it, right? But if you do one of those things in the and not addressing the other things, you still might not get well, right? right? Because if you have this total load, once you push your body into more danger physiology, you might have to eliminate a lot of a lot more things to get that total load down before the physiology goes back into a healing and repair mode. And I think that's one of the things. Sometimes we get caught on, I'm just, I've got mold exposure. I'm just going to keep hammering away at mold, hammering away at mold, hammering away at mold, and we miss all the rest of the picture. Okay, well, you got a bad relationship with your spouse. Maybe we need to address that too, right? Maybe there's, um, you don't breathe well, right? You, you, you have terrible breathing patterns. Maybe that's part of the issue as well. Maybe your, your sleep habits, sleep behaviors, they're awful. Maybe we need to work on those things, right? So we get caught up in one thing and sometimes we miss the low hanging fruit things that we can look at and identify. So what's from a testing perspective, is there any particular tests that when you're looking at toxicity, when you're looking at organisms that you feel kind of give us the best information as to, hey, this is these are the types of tests that we look at to identify this might be a problem. Because let's talk about heavy metals. There's different types of heavy metals. How, how do we determine the validity of a heavy metal test and whether that's maybe actually the issue. Cause I see a lot of people come in, they have their heavy metals tested. They're like, I have heavy metals. I've been doing this detox. I still don't feel better. But what's, where, where's your thought process on the accuracy of the tests that are available? And what do you think are the best ways to test for, let's say heavy metal toxicity? Yeah. I mean, obviously tests, tests, you know, like all over the place, you know, as you and me know, you know, every like, you know, few months there is a new company which is coming up and they claim that, you know, their test is the best, you know, and you know, like they have this new method of testing it. I'm a little bit of old school, you know, like I kind of go with the more established companies because those are the ones that, you know, we have a relationship and they have invested a lot of in their R and D departments, you know, because when you're at the Cleveland clinic, we were like looking at different companies and making sure that, you know, at least the ones that we're testing have some backing behind it. So in that way, like, you know, like regarding the heavy metals, you know, obviously heavy metals can be checked in blood. They can be checked in the hair. They can be checked in the urine. So those are the three most common places to check the blood, which is the most common test available in majority of the conventional labs only tells us the current exposure if you are getting from the heavy metals. So it doesn't tell us the complete exposure of heavy metal. So that's the reason it is not the most reliable test. Then comes the hair and then comes the urine. So some people like to test in the hair because again, they're looking at the total body burden, like, you know, how much deposited in, is in the hair. I think fa the, the hair test is not a bad test to do. I generally rely more on the urine test. Because, you know, at least there is some validity of the urine test available that, you know, um, how much excretion you are doing in the urine. Uh, but some of the hair tests, you know, like actually checks both your organic and your inorganic mercury levels. So those, again, at least gives you a little bit more better understanding to it. So the bottom line is that blood definitely not the best way to check, you know, like the heavy metals. Urine and hair are definitely a better test to do. 
whether those are completely reliable or not you know uh, i think the lab values do suggest that you know to some degree that those exposure or those values again they might not be completely reliable that okay well you know i have let's say six like you know if a person like six percent of mercury well you know that might not be completely reliable that's saying that okay you have six person and you need to get it to zero but yes if you have 60 percent mercury in your system that is saying that okay there is mercury present and that playing a role so we need to decrease it but we not always have to go to the zero levels that's not the like the goal the goal is to like to decrease the total body burden but then i think urine and hair analysis are fairly kind of you know a reliable test to do so so if we look at urine tests, because we see people come in with urine tests, say, oh my gosh, I've got, I'm toxic with this heavy metal. Are they? Or is the body actually doing what it's supposed to do? So, it, you know, it shouldn't the body be trying to push this stuff out through the, through the urine, through the tissues? If everybody's exposed and if they have it in their urine, is that? A problem. So sometimes people look at those urine tests and say, I need to ramp up my detoxification processes because I have this toxin in my urine, this heavy metal in my urine. But that's how the body made clear those things. So is it is that the problem or is that really saying, hey, my body's actually doing what it's supposed to do? It's releasing stuff that I'm exposed to. How do you interpret those results and obviously it's going to be different for everybody but sometimes i think that's that's where we go um so give me your your percept your your in, your take on that so uh so you're correct that you know like body is getting rid of the toxins if you're checking it in the urine which is definitely true but you know like the first of all you know like based on doing these tests you know time and again and let's say if, you know, like uh, people are getting exposed to the same amount of a particular heavy metal, everybody should have heavy metals in their system, but they are not, right? So that's where these testing companies have kind of known that there is definitely a higher load of those toxins in your system. And that's the reason you're releasing a higher amount of toxins in your urine also. So yes, your body is doing what it's supposed to do, but your total body burden is on the higher level as compared to the other person. So in that aspect, definitely we need to reduce the burden with that. So we need to figure out where the exposure is also coming from. So that's definitely one piece of it. So just ramping up your detox is not the only solution. You need to also figure out where the source is, why your body has higher amount of, let's say, mercury. Where is it coming from? So that's definitely an important piece of it. Yeah, I think you got to. I think if you get one of those tests done, you have to ask that question first, like, okay, where's the exposure, right? And if I'm getting exposed and I'm seeing that in my urine, number one thing to do is reduce the exposure. You can then recheck and say, hey, my burden, I'm, I'm seeing less in the urine and maybe my body was doing what it's supposed to do. But there are, there's some discussion about provoked and unprovoked tests when we're talking about heavy metal testing. Mm -hmm. So some people are saying, well, if you are toxic, the body's not going to release the stuff. That's why we have to do a provoked test. So we do a provoked test and that we do an unprovoked test. Then we do a provoked test. And for the listeners, that means you're doing something that's going to force the tissues to release the toxin. Where do you stand on the provoked, unprovoked cautions, concerns? Do we need to do it? Do we not do it, need to do it? Where's your thoughts on those? So previously I was doing a lot of those provoked tests, you know, like I will, you know, we will actually doing both. So we'll collect a sample and do the urine with unprovoked. And then after that, we'll give them the DMSA or that that's a typical medicine for the provoked test. We'll give them and then collect the sample and see the difference. And obviously almost invariably after giving the provoked text, we will see a higher level, you know, like that was the case. But then, you know, we were looking at the literature of saying that, okay, well, you know, like does the provoke test really have the backing that, you know, we are claiming it to have. And to be frank, we could not find too much literature saying that we need to do the provoke test only to find, you know, like a toxicity in a person. So that's the time I have backed off a lot on the doing the provoke test. I generally do unprovoked tests. Because my, again, thought process is that, you know, like if your body does have toxins, it should show up unless, you know, like you are that person who detox system doesn't work at all. And again, 
I'm a little bit like, you know, difficult to say that, you know, like really like, and we have those people that just don't release any toxins and their bodies filled with completely lead or mercury and they're not releasing anything in the urine. Can we have those? I don't know. So that's where, you know, I stunned, like, you know, could not find much literature, very strong literature supporting that everybody should get a provoked test. Sometimes we do give them in a little bit of natural supplements like glutathione or something else just to kind of, you know, optimize their channels. But uh, I have stopped doing the DMSAs because actually some people do react to DMSA. That's mm -hmm. a medicine that you, a lot of people are giving and people will have, even with one dosages, they will have bad reactions to it. So I said, well, just for doing the testing, I don't want to kind of put anybody's, you know, like uh, uh, symptoms getting worse or situations on board. So I stopped doing the provoke test. So I just do unprovoke now. And there is some discussion too, that if we start provoking the release of a whole bunch of toxic, chemicals, heavy metals from the tissue, and you already have compromised barriers, uh, that could be a real problem, especially blood-brain barrier being, you know, if that's the, the permeability there is increased, that could really make somebody not feel and function so good. So you, we, start, we talked a little bit about mold. That's kind of a really sexy topic. It, everybody's got mold toxicity. It's the root of almost everybody's issue. And I sometimes think that sometimes we we create a lot more anxiety in our clients than we need to when they're when they're hearing this. Oh my gosh, I've I've got mold. I saw a dot in my bathroom. Oh my gosh, I've got mold toxicity. Or I lived in a home 12 years ago that had mold and therefore I have mold toxicity. Well, did you move out of that house? Yeah, when? 12 years ago. Okay. But and we're still you're you're still thinking that's driving it. Is it possible? Maybe, but where do you see molds? How are we looking at molds? How do you take a look at it? How does somebody test for molds as a potential issue? And then what are what's strat what, like what is what's the strategy if it's if it's elevated? Right. So you currently pointed out, I tell each and every of my clients, whereas mold is present in all our environment. You know, like it is very difficult to not have mold in our environment wherever mm -hmm. we are going into. So you, everybody get exposed to the mold, right? You know, and the problem is that the, the literature that we have on the mold research is actually coming all from animal studies because, you know, like the mold was actually identified first in the livestock. And that's where, you know, like, you know, all the research was happening because they were getting sick because of they were eating all those grains, things which was not stored properly. And then suddenly we realize, okay, well, humans can also be affected with the same mold toxins. And now we're extrapolating it on them. So not everybody has mold toxicity, you know, like if you've been exposed to mold, we do have a detox system, right? That is supposed to take care of those mold toxins, like any other toxins. So just getting exposed doesn't mean anything, but checking the mold toxins is what I do to kind of know whether those are another factor which are overwhelming a person's system. So what we call, those are like urine mycotoxin tests. That's what we do, you know, like. Uh, to check for various mold species, not mold species, the mycotoxins in their urine and what is the level. Now, everybody, almost if I order these tests on 100 people, at least 90 will come back with some or the other mold toxins, you know, like, so again, it's not, if somebody has present a little bit of mold toxin, that's not a huge problem. But let's say the normal levels are five and that person, you know, has mold toxins 50 or 100. So that is like 10 times or 20 times higher. That is telling us that is, that is overwhelming the system or if there are multiple mold species which are at a higher level. That again tells me that yes, that is another contributing factor to overwhelming the detox system. And that's the time we definitely need to address it. Now, a lot of people think that, okay, well, what is, what is mold, right? You know, the mold toxins are living in the system. Let me just detoxify. Everything will be okay. It's not that mold causes something called SIRS, which is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Again, Basically, immune dysfunction happens in those things. Just getting the mold out from your system is not the solution because people follow, keep on following those mold tests like every four months. And they say, well, my mold like levels are better, but they're not back to zero. I said, well, that's not the whole point. The whole point is not getting the mold level to zero. The whole point is, first of all, reducing your exposure. As you correctly said, if you're living in the moldy environment, get it out. You know, if it is a possibility for a lot of people, that is not a possibility. So then obviously, you know, you cannot do that. If possible, get out from the mold environment. Then second of all, you know, start the detox process of removing the mold toxins, you know, like, you know, in, the, in a systemic manner. 
and at the same time also work on the underlying immune dysfunction of the SIRS, which has led, which is leading to the damage, which is the driving factor, and work on that aspect also, so that way your body can function better and can handle those mold toxins in a better fashion. Because you are going to get exposed to mold, you know, you know, again, time and again, and to get those mold toxins back to normal or zero might not even be possible. And that's not what we should be looking at, because then that's who those people that get into trouble, because they are doing those intense detox protocols. And suddenly, like, you know, they land up in the hospital because, you know, they had a bad reaction to it, or they got deficient into certain vitamins and minerals, which they not, which they didn't think that the intense detox protocol can got them to be lower on that also. So that's very important to understand what it does and how to handle it also. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll add to that, you know, there's, because some people, somebody will say, well, listen, I live in the same house with the rest of my family. It's the same old exposure. Why is it me? And so you could do, and I've done this, we've tested everybody in the house, right? And everybody's mm -hmm. got high exposure, but one person is chronically ill and the other people don't seem to have an issue. I think that A, that goes to the load, but there's another level of testing that we can do as well. And that is to look at the immune reactivity. And sometimes we could do that with toxins. We can do that with um, heavy metals and some of those things we can look at. Has the immune system identified the toxin as a problem. Now, typically like heavy metals, um, they're not necessarily, you get ex heavy metal exposure, that's not necessarily upregulating up -regulating the immune, the antibody system. But if you have the toxin creating damage to tissue and you get toxin and tissue, that then can produce what we call a neoantigen, a new antigen. And the immune system may not recognize that as self. And now every time you're exposed it actually results in damage to your tissue. And there's Cyrix Labs, a great tested, a great lab to do testing like that. So when somebody says, "What well, I'm living in the same house, everybody else, why me? Well, it might be, a, a, you've got other things contributing to your load. And two, it might be because this has been going on that your immune system has lost tolerance to that and can't, as soon as it sees it comes in, it goes, oh, that's that, that, that's this new thing. I knew what the mold thing was. I knew what my own tissue was. But when that came in and those two things combined, that triggered an immune response. So now you, every time you get exposed, it creates more upregulation of that immune inflammatory system. So that's another potential piece that somebody has to be con considered of. But getting out of the environment to at least calm the process down, especially if it's immune driven, if it's immune driven, you that's the situation where it becomes even more important. You got to kind of get out of that environment or reduce the exposure. So always take a look at stuff. Uh, and one of the things that most people don't consider, you know, we look at the walls, we're looking for stuff, but in our duct work and in our circulation systems, that's a, sometimes a place where people don't consider a lot of stuff is occurring and you, you go in there and somebody comes in and cleans out your ductwork and you're like oh my gosh what was growing in there because it's nothing we see we're looking for the stuff on the walls but sometimes it's the stuff that's behind the walls the stuff that's in our heating and air conditioning systems that we're just constantly blowing those things around so with the time we have left you wrote a, a book called reversing hashimoto's so tell us a little Give us some insight into the book and then maybe a few takeaway, easy strategies that somebody listening to this podcast can get done listening and say, okay, those are action steps I can take to help me try and reverse my Hashimoto's. Absolutely. So the reversing Hashimoto's, you know, the book I wrote, you know, um, my goal was to write a book in a very simple language so people can understand it. Because, you know, like we have other books, you know, which has been written in a more medical perspective, giving them a lot more depth and a lot more medical literature on it. My goal was to help them to understand why their Hashimoto's is not good and what they can do to get better. Obviously, there are medical references, you know, more than 150 references. So that way people know that what I'm talking about does make or does have some substantial backing to it. So in those books, you know, I share stories, you know, about clients, you know, who have worked with us, you know, like and have found uh, uh, their root cause and how it has helped them to reverse their situations. 
So in these three steps, you know, basically the first step is identifying the root cause. You know, like I spoke about all those five different categories. So I, I talk about all those five different categories. I give them actually a questionnaire in the book, which people, you know, where people can, you know, like uh, take that questionnaire and that can give them an idea where that is potentially the root cause playing a role in their situation. And again, I always tell people is that a lot of times people will read those five different categories and sometimes they will find more than one root cause. And they said, oh, well, that is not for me. And I tell them that is exactly for you because there is definitely more than one root cause playing a role. The second step is where we start the healing process. You know, like, you know, I've developed this mitothyroid diet where we um, kind of gives the gist of the diet in the book about potential bad foods, you know, which we call them inflammatory causing food, remove those food. And then include the food which reduce inflammation and heal your thyroid. And in the third step is we talks about these toxicities, you know, like about toxicities about remove how to remove the toxins, how to remove stress, how to uh, improve your immune dysfunction. So that's about the third step. So those all three steps are mentioned in the book. Uh, very easy read, very easy to follow. People can do it uh, so that they have first of all know what the potential root causes are there. And then the next two steps are about healing their Hashimoto's. Great. Now, in terms of things that people can do, uh, for me, it's always a starting with the basics. Um, so again, uh, if you want, actually, so on my website, there is also a quiz, which we call as a root cause thyroid quiz. So people who are interested in, they can go on our website called anshulguptamd.com and they can take this root cause quiz. Well, again, by answering those questions, it, it gives them a score into all these different categories. So again, that will help them to identify, okay, well, you know, what main categories I need to work on. So let's say like, you know, the category was mainly around food sensitivities. I say, well, at least start changing your diet. That is the easiest thing that you can do. You know, give up the processed food, give up fried food, you know, start eating real food, a lot of vegetables in your diet, good quality protein, good quality fats. So these are the things that easily you can do. Now, going, going beyond that, giving up gluten, sugar, dairy, that's obviously like, you know, depending on person to person, or if you can do it, that is great. But at least start eating real food and give up the bad foods that anybody can do it. And second strategy is stress management. Each and every one of us needs it. You know, it doesn't matter how easy your life is, how happy your life is going on through. These stress management techniques, which can be as simple as deep breathing exercises or just few minutes of meditation or guided visualization that you can do. That is very, very powerful. That is going to help to rebalance your hormones, reduce inflammation, so many benefits it is going to do. And again, anybody can do it. So why not start with incorporating that in your regular routine? So these are the basic things that anybody and everybody should be doing, you know, when they have Hashimoto's or thyroid disorders. Then going beyond it, I always recommend that's the time it becomes more individualized. That's the time you should start thinking about what is driving your immune dysfunction, your thyroid dysfunction. And once you identify those, then you take relevant steps to fix those. I, listen, I totally agree. You got to, if you're not doing the low hanging fruit things, uh, start doing those first. Right. Because those are the things we're going to try and get you to do. Eat better, sleep better, breathe better, all those things. And they're all free. And no, they're the hardest things sometimes to get people to do. And I want to, you were talking about the stress. And so I want to hit home with this because I think it's so important. When I see people that have been through five, 10 or more functional medicine practitioners and they've run all the tests, I've done every test, those are the people that I'm thinking they're impacted not just by stress, the stress impacts them, but that's what I call trauma. When your stress changes your physiology, to me, that's trauma, okay? So it could be the divorce you had. It could be the relationship with your kids that you don't really have or something like that. But when you're looking, if you've gone through multiple, multiple physicians, you've done all these tests, you've done all these protocols, nothing changes you got to start thinking, whether it's subconscious or conscious, what's going on in that headspace that may be manifesting this adaptive stress response, right? That's trauma. I think we throw the term around a little too loose at times. Everybody's traumatized. But to me, we talk about, because you get people to say, well, how am I going to get rid of stress? Everybody's got to say, you do. We all have to manage the stress. The thing we have to be most concerned about when the stressors, emotional, physical, whatever, B12, 
becomes traumatic, that's those are the people I see who are often really frustrated, can't find answers, and that's the piece we often have to unlock. Absolutely, I agree totally with that. You know, I cannot stress the importance of like how important it is to address this critical piece. And as you said, a lot of people ignore this piece a lot of times. So I always tell, please do not ignore this piece. This is critical. Absolutely. So uh, Dr. Gupta, I, pre I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on your Reversing Hashimoto Summit. It was great to have that conversation. This one was good. Uh, I know you've got to go. We've got to end this podcast, but I had another three or four pages of questions to kind of grill you with, and maybe we'll save those for another, another podcast episode. Okay. Absolutely. It was a pleasure, pleasure talking to you and connecting with you. I think you are doing awesome work. Your podcast is definitely a very big source of relevant and information for a lot of listeners. So I really appreciate the work that you are doing. Awesome. Great. Well, for the listeners, go check out Reversing Hashimoto's, the book as a, a guide to add that to your rest of your thyroid books. But uh, the principles in his book, the principles in my book, they're all the same. It doesn't matter what condition somebody has. The foundational principles are what are going to get you well. So don't be so worried. Well, I don't, I don't think I have Hashimoto's. I just have Get the books, read through the information, do the foundational steps. When you've done those things and you're still struggling, that's really a good time to reach out to somebody who's really got some, um, a lot of clinical experience in dealing with this and not just masking your blood values, but really helping you uncover maybe the hidden things that you can't find. So again, Dr. Gupta, I know we got to run, so I'm going to let you go. Thanks so much for being on the podcast and for the listeners, share this one with your friends and family. And uh, after you listen to this one, go back and pound that uh, review button to five stars, I think is what it is. That's the best one because it was a good podcast. All right, Dr. Gupta, take care. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.